Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Win. Hey there, welcome to ATL and 29 of Peach Troops podcast, where we look at the NBA from the starting point of Atlanta. My name is Kevin Chenard. I'm here with Glenn Willis. We are recording on a Sunday night after game two. We've got a 1-1 split and, you know, going into the finals here, you're like, I, I really want to just see a snippet and get a preview and, all right, you got your feet wet. Glenn, what do you think? I think it's been fun so far. I, you know, I feel like Golden State had control of game one in the third quarter. And I, I don't want to be dismissive of good work Boston did, but a lot of their come from behind win in game one was fourth quarter shot making that was way above any team's baseline. So a lot of shots went in. Um, and then Golden State kind of had their way in the second half of, of this game. So I still feel like Golden State can control this series, um, not like totally. But I feel like they do their job defense, um, play with attention and focus, play high enough on defense that they kind of – they still have an opportunity to kind of to control the series more than Boston does in, in my view. But I, I think Boston deserves a ton of credit in game one for weathering, you know, the uh, adversity parts of the game when they really could have let go of the rope, as NBA could just like to say, and hung in there, stayed with it. Uh, you know, when I think about it, it doesn't surprise me that a team that Al Horford plays on can stick with it and stay steady. He's he's such a he brings that kind of influence to the teams that he's on. Um, so you know, I'm I'm thrilled. I, I'm I'm team more basketball. So I, I love that every game to go <laughs> every series to go seven games to give us more basketball. Um, but it's been, I mean, you and I kind of previewed this, and we we're we were anxious to see what the coaching staffs would do, how they would match up, what they would run, you know, all that sort of stuff. And and I think it's been just Really, really interesting to kind, of, to kind of watch those aspects of game two. Also, I should say also after game two. <laughs> I was, what, maybe I should just put it this way. What does Boston have to do to keep from turning the ball over? Because it, it feels like if they, if they let Golden State get out and transition, they're cooked. Mm-hmm. Well, what, I mean, it's, what, where are these turnovers coming from? I guess. I mean, they're, I know I think, they've had problems with it, but like specifically, what are yeah. they, what are they missing? Well, well, I, I think they're missing more ball handling, you know, and I, this is, you know, we've talked, we talked a little bit in previous series about how Peyton Pritchard is a guy that helps you so much from a ball handling standpoint, right? Right. But then on defense, he presents challenges that are hard to work through. You know, and so I feel like um, Udoka is kind of in a in a constant state of like, uh, are we going to take care of the basketball enough without Pritchard on the court that we that I don't have to kind of um, put him out there and suffer whatever consequences might be on defense. Jalen is uh, you know, an average ball handler at best in my mind for a wing. Um, Marcus Smart is a good ball handler, a good creator, but this is the finals. <laughs> and this is kind of a different um, setting and. And you're kind of seeing that when the opposing defense gets up really high in the half court, that he's um, shows a little bit of limitation in that area as well. He was he was being, having to make longer passes tonight uh, because Golden State had extended his defense so high in the half court, and that was true of other guys that are trying to make passes too. So it's a little for Hawks fans to kind of imagine the turnovers they saw the Hawks make in that Miami series when Miami extended their defense and the Hawks were having to execute longer passes, you know, uh, yeah. in the half court. And I feel like that's where a lot of that's coming from for Boston and the fact that um, they do have some ball handling limitations and they do have, in my mind, surpassing limitations 
it kind of kind of shows up there. Um, so that, that's that's all I think. Longer passes by uh, average ball handlers and passers um, that the Warriors are kind of taking advantage of. But you, yeah, no, I, I like that you brought up that point because it did remind me of the Hawks series and that the it feels like the golden that Golden State is. Uh, you know, stunting in the lane, taking away driving angles and giving up some stuff behind at the rim, but they're not really giving it up either. Like Boston is not making them pay at the rim for their presence out, you know, near the free throw line when they're, when they're digging, when they're, when they're taking away driving lanes and, you know, Robert Williams doesn't look quite right. So you, you lose that lob threat. Al Horford, I thought had a really subpar game by his standards and he's, you know, he's just not making them pay at the basket either. And I don't know, Boston's going to have to look for solutions uh, to, to exactly what you've said about Golden State bringing their defense up higher. Yeah. And, uh, and to your point there, I mean, it's kind of like neither team has much in the way of generating pressure on the rim in this series in their current form, I should say, you know, like a healthy Robert Williams probably makes a pretty big difference, you know, for, for the Celtics and that he can kind of get behind the defense and, mm-hmm. and maybe create a, a better passing target um, you know, with a better shooting outcome, shot outcome for the team. But that's just, that's just not there. Grant Williams is not a vertical player. Al Horford at, at this age 36 now is, uh, he's never been a super vertical player, but that, that's not going to come from him either. And on the other side, I mean, the Warriors keep blowing layup after <laughs> layup, after layup <laughs> you know. True. So it's kind of right. funny to see a finals where both teams are struggling to really kind of generate pressure on the rim. And it's fascinating because they're both having to generate their offense from really kind of above the three-point break um, and try to kind of get to the heart of the defense. But both teams are extending their defense way up high. I do think the Warriors have for years run more stuff, more cut, cutting to the rim, cutting along the baseline. And so they have a little bit more organic kind of me- mechanisms to use to kind of generate that, even if, but if they keep missing the layups, it doesn't matter, I suppose. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, for me, like one of the big kind of fork in the road uh, aspects to the series right now, as I, as I look at game three and beyond is, more more do we does Pritchard get into the rotation or not you know and and if he if he does how does Udoka find the minutes that are a little safer for him on defense you know Mm -hmm. um because I I think it would make a big difference um to keeping Gold State out of transition yeah and and you mentioned both teams bringing their defenses up higher and then Pritchard needing more minutes like I would rejigger the deck to get Tice out. Like they're not extending their defense up when he's out there and it's hurting them a lot. Like I I just can't understand. I mean, I guess again, it it probably uh, goes back to Robert Williams being hurt, but he's just giving them nothing. Like I, you know, if if I have to pick between, uh, Pritchard's defense and and you know what Tice is adding on defense you know with what he's bringing to offense like I just I think I would I would definitely lean toward playing Pritchard more I just you're gonna have to play a lot smaller but this may be the series to do that like having having a traditional big isn't uh, a great boon against the Warriors in my opinion like I, I agree, and that's where the even if you have run. to like you know change something with with Robert Williams, like instead of playing Williams and Horford as much together, split them, like I, you know do something. Yeah, and that's where the roster construction, um, especially the four and the five being different on each side, right? I mean, if you look kind of like who else could Boston turn to, like Luke Cornett was you know a late season, he's not going to play meaningful minutes, etc. But you know. Golden State can turn to Bielitsa and get some shooting and some playmaking, you know, from those positions. They can turn to off order, you know, and get some get some pretty solid defense and some stuff there. Um, and that's even with like you know, Juan Toscato Anderson being on the bench, like as a guy who probably played decent a bit for the Celtics if you were, you know, on, on that side because of his shooting and because of his athleticism and things like yeah. that. So, you know, 
and that's without even putting you know Moody or Kaminga kind of really into the mix, you know, at the four potentially, if that's what position you'd have them play. So I feel like that's one thing that also kind of nudges Warriors towards you know being a a, a bit of a solid favorite here. It's just they have you know options that they could turn to at those positions where they need to and and, and get a bit more, um, especially uh, offensively. And I mean, yeah, maybe Elisa was on the court tonight. Boston was trying to put him in every single pick and roll. Mixed results. You know, sometimes it was looked pretty rough as it can with him. Other times he did okay, you know, with with the right help, you know, kind of around him and things like that. But it's it's, you know, it doesn't have to play be Elisa at all. But if it's a matter of kind of getting more skill packed into a lineup at the, you know, more skill at the four and five packed into a lineup, especially to get you through the the pool minutes and on step minutes especially with clay has nothing going to get more shooting in there in the form of your, you know, you know, guys that can play at the four and the five. That's a, that's a big difference. That's something that really Boston uh, that doesn't have. And and I think that that's going to be a factor. And I don't, I wouldn't say that Grant Williams is playing great, but you know, when you have uh, holes in the boat, like I don't think playing him 16 minutes in game one and 21 minutes in game two, you know, with some late game garbage time caveats, but I think there are, you know, there's, you can get more out of him. Um, I think he's a little bit vulnerable, but um, he's not as vulnerable as Tice. Like you, you have to have guys who can uh, play high and pick and roll defense. And, and, and I think he can, he may not be great at it, but I think he can give you a reasonable facsimile of, of, of what a good defender there might look like. Yeah, I, 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 I wasn't sure if Tyus was playing a little more tonight because Horper was having such a bad game. You know, I wasn't quite sure what, what they were doing there. Um, you know, Tyus has some shooting ability and you know, he's, a, he's a decent passer, you know, but I, I just felt like on defense, like uh, it's, uh, getting Tyus on the court when Steph is on is just seems like bad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, like, you know, to I, me. I mean, I, I don't want to just crap on Daniel Tyus like, He's a really good NBA player who's mm-hmm. just not here for the NBA finals. Like Steph Curry is a cheat code and the most transformational offensive player, maybe in NBA history. And Daniel Tice is a bad matchup for that particular player. So, you know, there are a lot of situations where, where Tice could help. He does not help here. Yeah. It happens this late in the postseason, right? I mean, think back to, the title that the Cavs won and like Kevin Love couldn't play for long, long stretches. And he was, you know, most people would say the Cavs, you know, I guess third best player, you know, on, on that roster. Right. Um, and, you know, but and he, he got caught out there if it's a possession one time and like kind of challenged Steph at the end of that, the, the, the game that decided the series. So, but I mean, I mean, I share that example to, to kind of the really good players get caught into uh, situations like this where they're just not that that viable, and, and that's just that's just how it goes. If, if that could happen to Kevin Love, you know, the, the five years ago or whatever number of years ago it was, then it, that could happen to certainly a guy like Daniel Tice right now. Uh. What what do you think of Golden State's offense uh, in, in games one and two? Because like I was kind of harping on before, like it it felt like they it, it took those uh, fast break transition baskets after turnovers to kind of get them in a rhythm in game two. But but you liked uh, you liked them in game one too. Like you you felt you said you felt like they were in control of game one. Did, did they have yeah. enough offense to kind of finish that? Um, well, I mean, I felt like they they were probably good enough offensively to win that game. Okay. Um, I, I just felt like, like I said, I thought the Boston shot making was just they were, you know, <laughs> you know, or they basically right. didn't miss. I think they missed what two threes in the whole fourth quarter in that in that in that in that first game. Um, but but I do feel like, especially with Clay struggling so much that it is put a lot on Steph now, you know, and then when I watch Steph now, I'm a different player, but I feel like 
I, mean, I have the same kind of concerns I had for like, Luka, you know, last series, like everything was going to Luca on the Dallas side, right? Because they're not getting anything from Clay right now. It's like, man, Steph has got to put up like close to 40 every game. And, and you just worry about um, kind of the, the, the toll that can take, you know, how that might uh, wear him down a little bit as the series goes, not to the point that he's going to, you know, give nothing, but that, you know, if this goes get seven games and, you know, and he's logging, what, 37 or 38 minutes a game, whatever the number is at that point in time, that it starts to show up and his performance, you know, in the most important game, the most important part of the most important game. So, you know, I don't know what it's going to take to get Clay going. Um, you know, it, I, I could like break down what I'm seeing in his shot. He's not on on balance when he's shooting. He's drifting left and right a lot, which right. normally he normally he can deal with a little bit of that. But he's getting um, his hips turned with that drift and things like that. So he just looks like he's his whole motion is out of sync and he can't kind of get himself lined up balance. But if I think uh, to kind of circle back to your question, there, if Clay is is going to be this, they're going to need a whole lot more from Wiggins in the half court in my mind. Um, or they're going to have to play more Porter, more be at least so to get some more shooting uh, on the court at, at those positions, which is, you know, be able to bring his defense, sort of, be least kind of a big man version of Pritchard right? <laughs> on the other side for the Warriors, the, the defensive risk is there. But um, I mean, Wiggins has, is good in transition, switching into the court. That's kind of where he is most free and seems like he's most confident. Um, but even tonight in the half court, I thought he was not great. And it took a, a great performance from Steph to kind of get them the separation that they got. So, you know, I, I still feel like the Warriors are the have the better chance to win this series, but there are some vulnerabilities that are present for sure. Clay not giving them anything on the offense. Draymond playing uh, with you no know, composer, it seems like most of the time, and, and whatever that's going to kind of turn into eventually. Um, Isn't that helping them? Uh, I feel like he thrives in the chaos. I felt like he got into Boston a little bit. I don't, you know, I'm not sure. I thought that, uh, I mean, I thought that affected Boston's kind of rhythm on offense too. A lot of the stoppages and, you know, kind of the tripping back and forth of distraction. Um, so, you know, in that sense, I think it does help Golden State in a way. Um, but I guess I guess you always feel like he's like always like right on the edge, you know. Uh, you know, but I, you know, I, I I definitely don't think he's always helping his team. I think he's kind of loses his focus sometimes. So, I mean, as good as he is on defense, the time when Golden State has screwed up their transition defense, sometimes it's been him. Um, you know, and I feel like that's him maybe getting a little bit too amped up and, and things like that. I mean, Draymond helps that team. There's no doubt about that. But in terms of some of his um, tendencies to uh, maybe lose a little focus or get too invested in some of the areas of the game that shouldn't matter as much, um, I still feel like some of that shifts more responsibility and workload um, to Steph. I mean, the biggest Draymond uh, kind of um, factor for me is, you know, do, do the Celtics eventually, or sorry, do the Warriors eventually move Draymond on to Tatum, you know, or do they stick with what they've been doing so far and not do that? Um, especially with the what what Tatum was able to do in the first half tonight, game two, I was questioning like, okay, is this is this? I know they love Draymond on Jalen because Jalen has a as we've discussed, uh, you know, a vulnerable handle and they feel like Draymond can kind of create turnovers and easy, you know, transition opportunities and such. But if, if uh, Tatum is going to kind of, uh, you know, be what he was in the first half, then I wonder how tempted Kerr was to make make a switch and get Draymond onto Tatum. Yeah. I, to, to backtrack a little bit, I, I think the continuity helps the Warriors with, with Draymond being Draymond, like, Looney and Steph and Clay all, you know, it's just background noise. Like they, <laughs> I think at this point, you know, they doesn't throw their rhythm at all. And, and he might bother, bother Boston a little bit, but. Yeah. Oh, what was the other thing I was going to say? Shoot. Ah. Oh, 
you mentioned Jason Tatum, you know, in the first half and he, you know, he really has it going. And, you know, one thing I, I'm wondering with that, especially, you know, with, with some of the, the types of shots that he can make where there really doesn't have to be a whole lot happening on offense. Like how, how do they get players like, you know, Marcus Smart into a rhythm with maybe maybe some offense that's a little bit more egalitarian because it just it it feels like there aren't enough touches for other guys early not necessarily even like shot attempts but just having a ball feeling a ball you know getting comfortable as the third best option on offense the fourth best best option on offense it just didn't feel like Boston had like a rhythm of continuity as an entire team on offense, even as Tatum was thriving? Yeah, well, it's a great question, but that's what I saw uh, the Celtics trying to do this whole game, this basically all of game two, was to try to mix in specific actions to give Smart a chance to attack uh, a defense that's overcommitted to Tatum. So, um, like, at one point, they tried what they, what they call – horns up and you can see Udoka kind of with the uh, index finger and the pinky kind of pushing those fingers up right he's calling for horns up that starts with smart and typically the four way 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 high that's why they call it horns up and and they they start it with a stagger and then once the ball hander crosses both screens uh the one big turns back and they set up in a really high traditional horns um, you know, a, after the staggered screen. And that was to create some drag action to b- create some opportunity to move the ball back to home, uh, smart there. And the Warriors were having none of that. The Warriors just brought their defense way up high and just got right in the middle of that. And then after that, um, kind of fell by the wayside, they went to what they call a uh, wide uh, double, which if you think about the ball being like just across half course on the left-hand side, a player without the ball on the right hand side gets a, a, a screen from a big man in the middle. So the guy on the right moves past the screen, then towards the ball handler on the left, and then the big man follows him to create the staggered screen there. That's what they call wide double. So the horns up and the wide double, they tried to run that like almost all of like say the second half of the second quarter, and then the third quarter and the Warriors are having none of it. So, you know, the Celtics have to kind of go back to the drawing board and kind of figure out, okay, we our normal stuff we use to rely on attacking defenses that are overcommitting the ball handler. The Warriors just brought more defenders up high, you know, and, and ran interference and traffic through all of that. And the Celtics got absolutely nothing from it. So I know that wasn't a very great breakdown with the non without any visual aid there, but, it, you know, that's what they tried to do. And it, it did not work. So I, I think they have to um, find something else. You know, I think there's see that coming the whole way, bring the defense up high, uh, and, and 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 don't really let the Celtics get into that at all. At least that's what happened in game two here. So I, what what type of action is is stuff that can penalize you for for being aggressive up high? Well, I mean, I, th- I think part of that is that they, when they run horns up in wide double, they're looking to kind of put smart. Hey, Tatum has the ball, say, two steps right of the left three-point break, right? Mm-hmm. And then smart's going to be right at the top of the key or a little bit further, one or two steps right at the top of the key. And to, c- to kind of create that 15 to 20-foot pocket where the ball can go there quickly, and he can attack the seam that's kind of on that slightly on, on the on the weak side there. That typically works, um, except that the Warriors are bringing extra defender up. So in my mind, the adjustment is to short roll smart as opposed to sending him to the three-point line, say 20 feet away from the ball handler, often Tatum, short roll him just below the top of the key, feed the ball there, and let him go attack downhill four on three. I, I was a little surprised that the Celtics never really got, got to that. Mm-hmm. They do a lot of that with Horford, as we all know. Sure. And Horford was just kind of not in any kind of rhythm tonight. So I don't know if they didn't try to get to that because Horford was a mess tonight. 
but they also never really showed they'll do that with smart quite a bit too and and we never saw it either so i, I feel like the next wrinkle is abandon the floating him out three-point line like get him near the nail for the short roll and attack that way makes sense to me um some offenses could say go ahead uh have guys cut to the rim and have you know someone execute that 30 foot pass or so i don't feel like the celtics have kind of the, the passing equity to uh it, to execute those long passes and we talked about that earlier we saw that tonight turn into too many turnovers so i feel like the short roll is is probably the next thing to give a shot all right yeah i i like that are there other things that you want to talk about to stand out in your mind? Well, I mean, you know, for me, you know, I thought the Warriors' defensive effort in game one was B minus. I thought it was, especially after the first quarter tonight, was a solid A. I don't know if they got quite the A plus. Um, it's, it's just, I, I think that's where that's the number one determining factor in every single game is how much intensity an effort the Warriors bring on defense, you know, they, they don't do a, there's a lot of things they have to do like ball pressure um, and, and closeouts. They don't naturally do well because they don't, they don't have a ton of athletes on the floor all the time. Right. Um, so it takes real effort uh, to do that. Um, right. and so I feel like that's, that's the biggest thing. That's what I'm watching most of all. And then for me, uh, when the Warriors kind of get it coming, can the, can the Celtics like they did in game one uh, stick together? and kind of just keep playing steady basketball and make it work. So that, for me, that that's, that's what I'm looking for. I talked about the adjustment for the Celtics getting to the short roll there. On the Warriors side, it really is, is it's more about kind of getting Clay going and getting Wiggins settled down in the half court. Um, and then if, if Boston has to play Pritchard, how do you attack him? If the Warriors have to play Elisa, how do you attack him? And so the rest of what I'm looking for kind of comes from those marginal rotation players that each could make or, feel like they have to put out there at some point in time. So that kind of covers what I'm looking for going into game three. Um, how are you feeling about the series at this point? Well, you know, you mentioned that, you know, Boston had an over their head shooting performance in, in game one. And then Boston, I think it was what, 11 first half turnovers where it felt like they could have they, I wouldn't say like a stranglehold, but I feel like they could have been in control of this game at halftime if they'd been more uh, judicious with the ball. I still feel like if if you have a game without sort of either one of those things, even if Boston doesn't get crazy hot on the shooting and, you know, if they just manage to not be punting the ball around, I still like their chances on defense. I mean, Steph is Steph, but like you've said, Clay is struggling. Uh, you know, they they brought Peyton into the rotation because he's healthy. You know, they're, so they're playing, you know, Looney, Draymond, uh, Peyton. I mean, there are enough, you know, guys on offense who aren't particularly scary, but you, you just got to be attentive to when and where they screen and, you know, whether or not you, you know, you're, you're trying to dance that dance between, you know, these guys aren't scary shooters. So, you know, you can, uh, you know, be a little bit more ready as a help defender, but they're all very good screeners. And, you you know, you've got to be aware of when you have to be up high because how good Steph is. And, you know, so they, they if they, if they get a little bit better at, at that dance, I mean, Boston is just has so many defenders that I trust that, you know, I, I think in a game where they don't turn it over and don't let Golden State get into a, a super good rhythm offensively, I think they can grind out some games at home. Yeah, I, I agree. I think I, I'm feeling, you know, I, I had Warriors in six, I think. Uh, I don't know if I said it, but I was I, I was considering, like, should be Warriors in five. I really thought Boston was going to have trouble defending the Warriors with Clay looking like he looks now, I think this, this feels like one's seven games now to me. I think, yeah. I think that's the likeliest outcome from a number of games it goes and then the Warriors would benefit from being at home, um, I would presume. So I still like the Warriors chance to win it, but I think Boston is, is um, getting a win in the first two games in, in San Francisco, San Francisco uh, where I happen to be right now, uh, was big. And I think they have some things to kind of take some confidence away. Um, they just have, 
fewer op, like back in the rotation options and, and they're going to have to manage through that. Boston has a really good coaching staff, so I wouldn't put it past them kind of figuring out how to get some more premature minutes safely, right? How to, uh-huh. how to get Williams and Horford kind of split up in a way that makes sense and, and get a little bit less ties in there. So I, you know, I'm not going to be surprised if they figure that out, but Hey, I'm team more basketball. So I'm hoping it goes seven games. Um, that's that feels like it's on a seven game trajectory now, which is a little different than what I expected before the series started as we discussed. All right. Anything else you want to add? I don't think so. It's been fun. All right. Well, I appreciate, uh, you jumping in late on a Sunday night and uh, we'll have to do this again soon. Look forward to it. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin.